try to move things along. Um, again, Ellen Zentner is the chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley. So without further ado, Ellen, please share with us your outlook for 2021. Lots of things going on. Sure. Thanks, Mike. So uh, I'm planning my talk to be around uh, 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, and yes, there is a lot going on. I'm also going to um, queue up for moving the slides forward as I go through the presentation. But, but first, I do want to send my personal congratulations to Brianna and Carla. Um, I love seeing these scholarships for, for economists, young economists go out. Um, I have a rich history with the National Association for Business Economics, uh, and so I love being able to speak to all of their chapters. Um, I was on the board of NABE, uh, I've been on the foundation of NABE, which is, awards these scholarships uh, at the national level as well, um, and I'm a past president of the New York chapter too. So uh, I've, been a, I've been a member, and this will certainly date me if my face doesn't. Um, since 1996 when I was working with the state of Texas and first joined NABE. So uh, it's also where I found my first job on Wall Street too. They have a nice jobs board uh, available too, which we've been making a lot of updates to. So um, with that, let me go ahead and jump right into the, the 2021 um, outlook. So um, if we move forward um, to my first slide, I just wanna give a snapshot um, of what we're looking at um, in the global uh, economy. And I apologize, as Mike said, we were having a little bit of glitches, so the slides may be a little um, slow to advance here, but, but don't worry, we will all get through this together. In the spirit of Inauguration Day, we are all going to get through this together. Uh, so we've seen a, a very rapid recovery for the global economy overall. Of course, the U.S. has been a big leader there, um, but so has China. Um, and it's really the outlook is being driven by the U.S. and emerging markets and, and China being an important part of that. And so um, I show these charts here so you can see just how rapid uh, of a recovery there's been. Um, so for the, the global economy, uh, we return to the pre-COVID path, and that's not just the pre-COVID level for GDP, but the pre-COVID path, so where GDP would have been had there been no downturn. For the global economy, we get there in the second quarter of 2021. For the U.S. economy, we get there by the fourth quarter uh, of 2021. Um, and that's important because I think the, the body of literature shows that the longer it takes to grow out of deep downturns, the more lasting scarring there can be to the economy. So you certainly want to ensure as rapid a recovery as possible. And part of what's been helping or a good deal of what's been helping this recovery is one, the structural nature of the downturn that once we get past uh, vaccinating a good portion of the population, we can see activity uh, start to normalize or what the new normal will look like. Uh, and it's been backed up by a tremendous amount of fiscal policy stimulus and a very accommodative, very upfront uh, and aggressive uh, Fed policy. And so that's all helping to quicken the recovery and will lessen the long-term damage uh, on the economy. So let's dig a little bit more into, into the US. Uh, so in this next slide, um, it's really about a change in growth leadership here. So here I, I drill down into the U.S. specifically. So you can see on the left-hand side, again, that, that very V-shaped recovery that we've been in. Uh, some can call it K-shaped, uh, underlying the V-shape because it's been very industrial driven uh, up to now. Uh, and so in 2020, uh, you know, we saw the industrial side of the economy really lead. So uh, a lot of that driven by the demand for goods in the economy on the part of consumers, um, the rest of the global economy, uh, starting with Asia, starting to pull out of lockdown, a lot of pent up demand coming through. We had a great need to build inventories. And in fact, uh, through November, we know from inventory data that some sectors still have historically low inventory to sales ratios. And so I think we are still uh, underserving ourselves in terms of inventories which will lead to continued inventory building, I think, for, for several more quarters. And so really, GDP saw such a rapid recovery in 2020 because GDP uh, has been driven by the goods side of the economy. Uh, and so I just show here what the recovery looks like compared with 2008. 2008, of course, being marked um, in large part by a big bursting of an asset bubble. 
household balance sheets being well out of whack. Uh, we spent five years deleveraging that depressed growth for quite some time. And we went into this downturn without that debt overhang on household balance sheets. So the lack of a balance sheet recession on top of this downturn as well has helped um, set the stage for a bigger rebound. But look at the chart on the right. Now you still have a more rapid return of jobs than we did post GFC but it's a much slower return than you saw in GDP that I show on the left. And that's because the jobs, uh, the labor side uh, of the economy is more dominated by services. And of course, services sector um, is being hampered uh, more so uh, by COVID than the good side of the economy. So that's important as we think about how things change in 2021 because we think that good side of the economy having met a lot of pent up demand uh, and with a lot of the fiscal stimulus behind us and the economy starting to open up in 2021, that growth leadership will shift to the services side. And that's very important for determining how fast growth will be this year, how much will bring the unemployment rate down um, and how much the services spending will come back. And I'll get into that, that further uh, further on in the in the presentation. Um, so let's go forward a slide and, and talk about some of the dynamics um, in how uh, the stimulus has been helping the economy and will continue to help the economy. So if we think about the nature of the job loss that we've seen, uh, on the left-hand chart, I show the amount of job loss uh, by sector. And you can see that through December, 78% uh, of the jobs lost have been in service sector uh, areas of the economy. And in particular in leisure and hospitality um, and area of retail trade, and of course, uh, healthcare, uh, because a lot of people are still postponing uh, broader healthcare visits um, as the healthcare system is, is uh, burdened by uh, the virus uh, and vaccine at the moment. Um, if you think about just the December payrolls report alone, more than 400,000 jobs were lost in those leisure and hospitality sectors. So that if you stripped out the very COVID related uh, uh, areas that were impacted, you actually continued to show broad job gains across the economy. So uh, it is a good sign uh, that you have uh, job gains elsewhere and that the job losses and where we're hampering job growth still remains very COVID related because that means that there's a greater chance uh, that uh, as the economy is opening up, more of those service jobs will come back and add to those job gains uh, again more broadly uh, in the economy. Um, but because of the downturn uh, and where the job loss was concentrated, uh, as you can see on the right hand chart, I compare low wage paying, middle wage paying and high wage paying jobs, uh, the loss of those jobs in 2020 compared with the 2008 downturn and the 2001 downturn. And you can see that a tremendous amount uh, disproportionately were lost among the low wage paying industries. And of course, because those are, are dominated uh, uh, those jobs dominate the service sector side. And that's important because when we put the CARES Act into place, we ended up mostly impacting or impacting most those lower uh, income households. And so the replacement rate that we saw uh, in terms of replacing that lost income from the lost jobs was tremendous. Um, and it had important implications for the household sector and supporting the household sector even beyond when a lot of the benefits were expiring over the summer. So let's take a look at the, the next slide. So coming into the end of the year, um, I'm gonna show you what uh, excess income and savings uh, looked like. Um, so this is data through November. That's the, the latest data that we have in terms of the monthly personal income and, and spending uh, data. So if you think about you know, uh, the, the transfer payments from government, so not just the federal supplemental benefits, which added to those regular unemployment benefits and other pandemic unemployment benefits, but also the direct checks that were mailed to households from the CARES Act. Um, that ended up creating a savings cushion across all income groups. 
because you had a tremendous amount of excess income. Um, the replacement rate was upwards of 120% uh, because we were targeting a lot of low uh, income households. And so we built up excess savings. And so on the right hand side, I show you what excess savings looks like. So we calculate what savings was over a 12 month period prior to the CARES Act and that was what savings was since. Now, part of this is that during lockdown, we were sending people all of these payments at a time when they couldn't spend it. Um, but what happens is normally only the wealthy households save in the US. Uh, but we saw savings for the first time build up across all income groups. And that's important because when you think about the marginal propensity to consume out of that savings, it is much higher for lower income households. They typically don't carry savings. And so they're the first ones that are going to spend down that savings given the chance. And so that's important because at the end of July, when those federal supplemental benefits expired, we would have expected a sharp drop off in consumer spending and we didn't see it come through. In fact, consumer confidence, even among low income groups continued to increase over that time. Spending continued to increase over that time. And we saw that they were drawing down that personal savings rate. Now, by the end of the year, we were still sitting on about $1.4 trillion in excess savings. Much of that was sitting in upper income households. They don't tend to spend a whole lot of that. Uh, and, um, uh, and we could see from the, the uh, underlying data that the low income households had now spent through that savings cushion that they had earlier in the year. Uh, and so what's important is that I'm going to talk a little bit later about what's coming around the bend from not only the 900 billion stimulus package that was passed in December, but what we think may be coming uh, after the Biden administration now that sorry, now that the Biden administration um, has uh, taken over. Um, so next slide, let's take a look at what households um, did with their uh, savings. Uh, so here I show, uh, I index um, uh, to the, the uh, just pre-COVID, I index spending on durable goods, non-durable goods, and services. Uh, and you can see just how big the rise in durable goods spending was. Um, now, some of that is those are big ticket items uh, where interest rates matter um, and the Fed got interest rates down very sharply, very quickly. But also when we get stimulus checks, we also tend to see that durable goods is one big area where those checks tend to get spent. In 2001, we sent out stimulus checks and they immediately made it onto the dealer lots. And we saw motor vehicle sales jump in one month to their highest annual rate on record, and it's still the highest annual rate on record in October 2001. Um, and so we saw coming out of lockdown, a lot of pent up demand uh, for durable goods and mostly expressed in, in motor vehicles. Non-durable goods has also remained very strong though. Uh, again, both of these jumping back to pre-COVID levels by June, uh, quickly after lockdown uh, ended. Non-durable goods was driven a lot by the housing, housing market. Now, certainly COVID-related um, COVID uh, developments have driven more people, especially where I uh, am sitting here in, in New York City, um, driven many people away from apartments and to seek out single family homes in order to get more space, more uh, space for their children to run around to, more freedom to walk out your front door into the great outdoors rather than walking out into the inside of an apartment building. Uh, and so there, there's some COVID related lift to that. But I also wanna be sure that we don't discount how important the Fed's transfer mechanism is, transmission mechanism is to affecting the broader economy. That was a big drop in mortgage rates um, and which alleviates a lot of the cost pressures, uh, the affordability issues that had risen in the last cycle because home prices had been rising alongside higher uh, interest rates. Um, our housing strategists expect the housing uh, home price appreciation to slow in 2021 this year, um, but economic activity generated by housing to remain uh, very strong. So a very uh, uh, positive outlook um, on housing to continue. But look at the light blue line here, that's services. And again, because it's hampered more so by COVID uh, and restrictions, especially in the high density areas of, of services. 
services makes up about 60% of all consumer spending. You can't have a proper recovery in consumer spending without seeing services um, recover. So that's the snapshot of what it's looked like through last year, but let's talk about going forward. So in this next slide, let's look at the um, coming share shifts uh, that we expect um, in consumer spending. So we've got, uh, uh, there we go. So um, the level of nominal PCE is shown here on the left and then marked by our forecast. So here you've got uh, non-durable goods uh, and durable goods. Services, uh, again, we show here is longer to come back, um, but look at the share of PCE forecasts on the right-hand side. If we think about it in terms of share, we reached um, uh, well higher uh, than pre-COVID peaks in terms of share of overall consumer spending devoted to durable goods um, and non-durable goods, but you can see it mostly in durable goods here. Um, so while the share of durable goods and non-durable goods this year recedes from those 2020 highs, the share of PCE devoted to services spending picks up. And this goes back to something that I talked about at the very beginning, which is that, that uh, uh, growth leadership uh, change this year. You're gonna be bringing more service jobs back to the economy. You're gonna be opening up more services uh, in the economy. You're gonna afford more opportunities for households to spend uh, on services. And, and I'll just uh, take the opportunity here because I didn't talk about COVID itself at the beginning. Um, in terms of services opening up in the economy, it's not just about getting past a point where we are starting to uh, vaccinate the broader population. We think we start to move on to the broader population, uh, having the vaccine available in April, we're starting to vaccinate the broad population uh, with the second dose in June. I think it takes quite some time for herd immunity. So I'm certainly not waiting on herd immunity to drive this more positive outlook. But if you think about just the seasonality of coronaviruses in general, um, we expect the case counts to hit a plateau in March and then start to come down from there. Uh, and especially we're gonna be watching hospitalizations uh, as well and the death counts as well. Um, in our consumer surveys, households tell us that they're more concerned about hospitalizations um, and death counts than they are in just the overall counts. But as we move further into the spring, we should be seeing uh, the, um, uh, just the seasonality of coronaviruses recede where more state and local government um, impediments will be lifted. You'll start to see some restaurants add back capacity, even if that's just the ability to dine outdoors again in some parts of the country. So it's not like there's a, there's a, 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 a um, demarcation where you have no growth and then suddenly growth. I think we're gonna be growing through getting the, the vaccine. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the stimulus. Uh, in the next slide, I just wanna compare here um, what we gave, this is focusing on households only, um, what we gave households compared to what we're giving um, in um, uh, the December 900 billion package that was passed and what we expect to be passed in the first, first quarter of 2021. Um, now, what was passed in December is hitting households now. So we reinstated um, a federal supplemental unemployment benefit. Um, it's half the amount that we gave uh, in the CARES Act. Uh, and we uh, once again sent out one-time checks. Uh, it turns out they're not going to be one time. They're going to be a third time <laughs> in the first quarter. Um, but we started to send out checks again to households. Um, about 30% um, uh, of those household checks have gone out now uh, and uh, have been hitting accounts. And so that is coming at a time when without further stimulus, you would have seen most likely a negative quarter of growth in 2021 here as we sit in the first quarter. You've seen significant declines in consumer spending in November, in December, um, some of that is just renewed restrictions. Some of that are households self-policing during a time when case counts are rising. And so uh, it's not a surprise that, uh, that we're going through those consecutive declines of consumer spending. 
Um, so this help for households, even if a good chunk of it is saved as we would expect it to be, uh, because you'll see the savings rate pop again higher in the first quarter, um, a good deal of it will also find its way into the economy just in a different way. As we moved into the winter, we moved back online. We've seen delivery services pick up again. We've seen online ordering pick up again. And we know how to do this, right? We learned it during lockdown. Uh, even the, the most, uh, 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 even the, the, those that supported delivery services the least came to embrace it. Um, so what are we expecting in the, in, further to come from the Biden administration? So uh, President Biden has asked for $1.9 trillion um, in spending. Um, look to the moderate Democrats uh, to understand what he could possibly do. Um, moderates will control uh, the stage here. Um, and there are aspects of that stimulus plan that the moderates do not support. We think that what they will be able to pass is around a trillion dollars, which will increase the federal supplemental again, which will top up the recovery rebates. Again, it will important, importantly include the state and local funding that was left off of the December package. Um, and of course, a lot of, of spending uh, on uh, vaccine development, testing and tracing, uh, and the like. Uh, and so um, that's, uh, uh, you know, the Georgia outcome uh, led to the markets anticipating this further delivery of stimulus. We've seen on the back of this, the Fed gained traction in inflation markets as more fiscal stimulus has supported their easy monetary policy. I'll talk about inflation uh, in just a moment. Um, but that's what we're expecting out of the Biden administration, more front-loaded fiscal stimulus um, and then later this year in a, in a reconciliation bill, they'll be talking about, we think on net, another one and a half trillion dollars in spending. I say on net because it's going to include tax increases, but much more spending uh, uh, in terms of um, healthcare infrastructure uh, uh, coming in that. So another more fiscal deficit expansion later this year. Um, Next slide, just how and when are the rebate checks spent? Um, I won't spend too much uh, time on this. Um, I alluded to the fact that those checks are coming through. Uh, and so um, they will be, uh, so this is the, I'm not sure if we can go on to the next slide. This is just, uh, is an illustration of showing that when we do get those rebate checks, we tend to save 30% uh, or more of them uh, we send towards savings. We tend to pay off debt with another 20 plus percent of it. So you're talking about 50 to 54 percent of these that get counted in the government data as savings. And that's why you'll see a big jump in savings in the first quarter. But the rebate checks do tend to get spent in the first 10 days. If we look at what happened around the CARES Act and those rebate checks, we did see it flow into the economy pretty quickly. quickly. And so that's why even on just the 900 billion, uh, a stimulus package in December, that's going to lift uh, Q1 spending. And then if you get another package on the order of a trillion dollars in March with those stimulus checks coming through again, you can start to see that spending come through later in March, but we'll probably further support second quarter as well. Um, next slide, labor market recovery. Um, just uh, one point on this. Uh, so Besides all of this fiscal help, we want to be sure that we are encouraging a rapid recovery in the labor market. This uh, next slide on the labor market recovery gives you a sense of what we're expecting on the unemployment rate. Uh, and so we are looking for 5% unemployment by the end of this year and further down to 4% by the end of, of 2022. Um, now that solid labor market recovery is necessary because at some point you're going to be moving from an incredible amount of fiscal stimulus this year into fading fiscal impulse in 2022. And so you need that underlying recovery in the labor market to be strong in order to bring labor income back to pre-COVID levels. We're still well below pre-COVID levels on labor income. Um, and this is one thing that the Fed is focused on. We've seen Janet Yellen in her testimony uh, in front of Congress uh, yesterday remind us that she's going to be a Treasury Secretary that's still very much the labor economist that she's always been. Uh, and so she's very much focused on the labor market recovery. Uh, the core of the Fed is very focused on the labor market recovery. 
One reason why they're so focused on maximum employment now, just simply driving the unemployment rate as low as they can possibly get it. Uh, and that's important because one thing that I don't show in this presentation is that they're very worried about the, some of the structural uh, uh, impediments to the labor market. For instance, the uh, rise that we've seen in the long-term unemployed, uh, which of course is, is much more um, prevalent in minority communities um, and for women versus men, uh, you need to encourage as rapid a recovery as possible in the labor market so that you don't lose them altogether. The probability that someone who is unemployed for a longer st stint leaves the market, the labor market altogether, rises quite a bit. Um, and so that's one reason why you will continue to hear leaders, including at next week's uh, 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 FOMC meeting, um, continue to press how important it is that the employment side of the mandate is just as important as the inflation side of the mandate, because they're very worried as they should be about the possibility that these structural uh, issues in the labor market uh, lead to permanent uh, job loss. Uh, and it's better to err on the side of caution, leaving monetary policy too loose for too long um, than to tighten policy prematurely. Um, so one slide here on inflation and then one slide on monetary policy and I'll uh, open it up for questions. So the next slide, I'm gonna give some details about our inflation forecast. Now, um, you know, this may seem like a very optimistic um, story that I'm telling of the economy and notice that I didn't put out any exact growth numbers there. I'll give you some of the growth numbers now. Um, GDP this year, uh, even before the trillion dollar package uh, that we're expecting now from the Biden administration. Our forecast for GDP this year uh, is 6% on a Q4 over Q4 basis. So that includes the 900 billion package that was passed uh, in um, December, but does not yet include the trillion dollars that we expect to be passed in the first quarter. So you can imagine uh, that GDP could be north of 7% this year. Um, that's how much fiscal support you're getting on the back of uh, the, the uh, very easy uh, monetary policy and COVID uh, loosening its grip um, on the economy as we move further uh, through this year. Uh, and so one thing that that that's leads to is our uh, better than, than uh, uh, consensus expectations on uh, the unemployment rate and our above consensus expectations on inflation. Now, why higher inflation now? Well, in the near term, we take a very bottoms up approach, component by component um, to inflation. And, uh, and sure, there, there's a, a strong story to tell this year also tied to that growth leadership, right? So the good side of the economy leading in 2020 is what helped pull us out of disinflation around lockdown. And so that's 25% of the core inflation bucket. But as goods inflation starts to recede this year or decelerate, services inflation will accelerate. And that's 75% of the core inflation bucket. Um, and so some of this is just reflecting that growth leadership, right? These inflation indices are all demand weighted. And so if that's gonna be your driver of demand this year services, then it's going to in general um, contribute more to inflation uh, than it did last year. There's another element here though. And of course there's supply constraints so you're gonna be opening up the economy um, with more demand, pent up demand for services coming through, even if it's to a much smaller degree, even if it's the new normal is something not anywhere where near what the normal looked like before COVID, you're gonna be increasing demand for services at a time when supply constraints in the services industry are quite high. That's temporary because eventually supply comes back online and the Fed will acknowledge that that it is transitory, but that is something that also drives inflation higher this year. But then there are some elements that are not transitory. Uh, and so another key element of our inflation call is that, you know, I'm not gonna argue with a flat Phillips curve. I think it's very difficult to argue that the Phillips curve is not flat. But if you look at component by component, there are some components in core services that do show a very strong uh, uh, Phillips curve relationship. One of those is rental prices. 
that was prevalent in the last downturn as well. I mean, in the last business cycle, and we think it will be prevalent this time as well. So rental prices have been decelerating and we expect that deceleration to continue. We saw it in December. We expect it to continue until August where we think it bottoms and starts to turn upward again. Again, tied to the path of unemployment. And that's important because it gets a very large share in core services. And so that's just one element um, that is not considered transitory that will be driving inflation higher. So in our forecast, we have inflation getting to 2%, core PCE get, getting to 2% um, uh, year over year um, by the end of this year and sustaining above that uh, going forward. Um, now, does the Fed need to react to that? And so let's talk about monetary policy and then I'll take questions. Um, so monetary policy is the last slide that I want to end on. Um, and so does the Fed need to respond to that kind of inflation? Yes, our inflation forecasts are well above consensus. We have the Fed spending, uh, 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 you know, above 2% uh, for uh, quite some time starting in December of this year. Uh, you know, if there's questions around that, I can talk about near-term inflation. We're going to get well above 2% just for a month or two in the near term here, but that is also transitory. I think Chair Powell will address it next week. Uh, and inflation markets have been well, well anticipating that. That's just because of the easy year on year comps with, with COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, the Fed has adopted a new inflation framework. Um, they are pleased that they are, uh, that in, they're get, gaining traction with inflation markets of late because these further rounds of fiscal stimulus have now combined with their easy policy. Uh, but they understand that in order to uh, hold on to that traction in inflation markets, they've got to be sure that they are firm in their commitment to that new flexible average inflation targeting framework. That means also recognizing the asymmetric risk to raising rates too early uh, when you're at the zero lower bound. Um, and so we expect the Fed to raise rates in the third quarter of 2023. And that may seem odd that we're not expecting it sooner given our well above consensus growth forecasts and above consensus inflation forecasts but we think that that's the kind of evidence how long they would want to see or need to see inflation above 2% um, and be dead set on maximum employment because it is both sides of the mandate that they have to meet um, before raising interest rates. I do think, however, though, that uh, we're seeing uh, the nascent signs that some policymakers are starting to contemplate when could it be necessary to take your foot off the gas pedal while they may be far away from raising rates, if we have the kind of outlook that we expect this year, is it necessary for them to continue to press so hard on the gas pedal with the pace of asset purchases at a time when you could be looking at a very different outlook for the economy? Do you need to press the gas pedal that hard? So we do think that on our outlook by December uh, of this year, they are announcing that tapering will begin in January of 2022. We do think that as the cloud of COVID is at least thinning as we get closer to the middle of the year, we will be starting to get that long heads up from Chair Powell that he has an affinity for providing to markets ahead of policy changes to get the markets thinking that an announcement of tapering isn't so unthinkable um, uh, on the horizon, horizon being a six month horizon or so. Uh, and so um, I think it's very appropriate for them to at least continue to provide accommodation, but at a slower pace by tapering the balance sheet before pausing for some time uh, and then lifting off later. So with that, let me go ahead and um, uh, Mike, I don't know if you want me to go ahead and read through the questions. I'll, I'll rephrase, but okay. um, let's take a, a couple of pieces here. So first... Um, we'll, we'll start with where you left off, which was the Fed, I guess, since we'll, you were just addressing that. So a, a couple of pieces. So you don't, sounds like you don't think that they'll do anything as far as taking the foot off the gas or announcing or signaling that until later in the year, until everything's essentially the proof being in the pudding, right? Not talking about the pudding the way the bond market's already saying, oh no, they're going to, they're going to start tapering, you know, mid 21, right? Yeah. Is that so I'm hearing that correctly? 
Yeah, and but I okay. think the, the messaging is key there. You know, I think in the minutes from the December meeting, um, even though only a few participants, which I would I would believe uh, that that President Bostic would have had to be one of those based on his most recent comments, a few participants at least thought it appropriate to voice that if right if everything falls in line with my outlook and we get a robust uh, recovery in the second half of, of the year with evidence that we think uh, that suggests that will continue, then it might be appropriate to start tapering uh, the balance sheet. We saw a few venture that and stating that those few also felt that a very uh, long heads up and clearly communicated uh, intent would be important. So if we see that continue to grow, so say when we get the minutes from next week's meeting, if we get the minutes from the March meeting, you know that all along you're starting to hear more and more voices, and you can see that that consensus start to build. Then markets will really get a heads up before even uh, Chair Powell might might confirm it that indeed it's something that is going to be uh, coming. But but I think something that that you may have alluded to there, I, I do think that that um, uh, markets have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves in terms of the movement in rates um, here. Now, some of that was the Georgia outcome, uh, uh, but also the, the talk of, of, of tapering. You know, the markets don't tend to hear, you know, we often say they don't speak the same language as the Fed. Um, and the Fed speaks similar language to economists, right? Everything that I give, I caveat the hell out of it. Um, but they don't hear the caveats. Um, of course, if everything is absolutely beautiful and falls in line with my outlook, the Fed would be crazy to not at least be talking about the appropriate time to start tapering. Um, and so I do think that Chair Powell is going to reiterate what he said in his recent speech next week, where he says, look, these are early days. Um, this is not the time under the cloud of COVID to start talking about when we might remove policy accommodation. There will be a time for that, but it's not right now. Um, and I think as they continue to show how high the bar is for eventual rate hikes, I think that will take some of the steam out of out of these uh, market expectations. So in in Powell speak, I think that was earlier. He said we're not even thinking about thinking about <laughs> removing it. It's maybe we'll start thinking about it. But yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I, I agree that they'll probably um, telegraph it well in advance. Uh, so we have gotten a couple of questions. Uh, the other one, I guess, is the obvious one, since we just mentioned Powell's name. Um, any kind of what's the over and under? What's Ellen's over and under on Powell stays, gets reappointed, or he, uh, he, President Biden, chooses to move in a different direction, and maybe it's Leo Brainerd or some of the other people, um, including um, President Bostic here in Atlanta, or someone else gets chosen. What, what's your over and under? Very quick, like on that one. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I have waffled of late. Um, I was very convinced early on that uh, that uh, Biden um, would uh, not un that would not stick with his historical precedent. Let's set President Trump aside because he broke from historical precedent. He did not keep the sitting chair, even though he said, in his opinion, she was doing a good job. Uh, that he wanted to put his own stamp on things. Uh, and so I assume that Biden coming in um, would want to, um, uh, would continue to break from uh, precedent and put his own stamp on things, right? We've seen from his own uh, nominations uh, for uh, heads of, of agencies, right? With that very yeah. firm focus on uh, diversity uh, and that um, uh, Powell not only being of a different political mindset, but also not quite meeting that diversity, uh, that wish for, the strive for diversity. Um, however, um, I have been convinced from talking to other folks uh, more lately um, that Biden uh, is more likely for the Fed chair, at least to stick with historical precedent, that you don't replace the sitting chair for consistency and continuity, you keep the sitting chair. And especially if you think uh, he's doing a good job, he or she is doing a good job. Uh, and so um, I'm not so sure that, that Chair Powell is going to be uh, replaced now. Um, we should, if there is, uh, of course, the media is always the first to get a jump on it. But if we do 
form our thoughts throughout the year and think that there is a good chance that Chair Powell will get replaced, then by August, uh, we should start to, um, uh, we should get a nomination, especially if it's gonna be a more controversial nomination or something, ones that's not expected to go uh, very quickly or very easily. By August, typically you would, you would hear the name and know who that will be. Um, if it is someone else, as you said, Bostic is a great choice. Um, Roger Ferguson is a great choice. He was vice chair of the FOMC. Now, uh, Roger has said that he's going to retire in March from CREP. Uh, he very well could simply be retiring uh, because he has been talking about it for three years. But it is also, um, you know, interesting timing. Uh, and I've been told by his close friends that uh, he is not a man who retires. He has to have his fingers in everything. Um, but I, I don't, uh, but so, you know, Roger Ferguson is a possibility. Lael Brainerd, I think, is less of a possibility for Fed chair. I think that she will come into Randy Quarles. So she will have an executive position. Among the three executives on the F1C, there's uh, the chair, the vice chair, and then the vice chair of banking supervision. I think that when Quarles' term is up in October of this year, she will be nominated to move into the vice chair of banking supervision uh, position. So I think that's going to be Lel Brainerd's next uh, next move. Sure. All right. So uh, since we're kind of there, I'll, I'll touch on one of the questions that was somewhat related, although not exactly Fed related, but was asking about the velocity of money. And that's been something that folks have been talking about with respect to the inflation discussion. And you did a, a very good job of kind of laying that out, but there are several inflation questions, as you might guess, but one about the velocity of money and how it remains low, despite what the Fed's done. Um, what can be done to increase the velocity of money to, to essentially force higher inflation? Yeah, so <clears throat> you're right. Your money supply can be there, but if there's no money velocity, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we don't explicitly make an assumption about money velocity in our inflation forecast, but we do implicitly capture it. Part of that is the tremendous buildup in savings uh, that ends up that when that savings is drawn down. Um, and savings rates, uh, you know, really in 2020, the savings rate was drawn down out of necess necessity because of the lack of income growth. When you have, though, a savings cushion and you have growth in labor income, which we would get on the back of further improvement in the labor market. You know, that it's really that assuredness about financial, your financial situation um, that makes you feel more comfortable to draw down that savings rate and spend. And so we need the unemployment rate to come down further, more of that labor income to come back, but, but still sitting on a tremendous amount of savings that we have not yet deployed. And that's what gets you money velocity. So in a way, it's implicitly captured in our forecast that we have the unemployment rate going moving lower and service sector jobs coming back. So labor income finally reaching back and moving through pre-COVID uh, levels and more of that service sector activity coming back. But the mo money velocity has to get be there. And for that, you need, um, uh, you need financial stability you need uh, uh, financial expectations of households to rise further, which we should see alongside the further uh, labor market recovery. Okay. Uh, next one, kind of first cousin to that. Um, when do you see the 10 year increasing? And obviously, there's an impact from inflation at, at mortgage rates. And there's a couple questions um, r related to that. So, kind of where do you see the 10 year? Uh, moving, increasing, and impact on mortgage rates? So we have the 10-year, our rate strategist pegged the 10-year at, at 150 by the end of this year. Um, you heard me say that I think, you know, just in the near term here, rates markets have, have gone a little bit too far um, in making assumptions about the removal of monetary policy accommodation. Um, I think some of that uh, move will be, um, some of course will be risk premium, some will be term premium, um, but, um, but I think it's going to be, uh, you know, muted to the extent that I expect the Fed to stick to its guns on its new uh, flexible average inflation targeting framework, which means uh, over time markets will come to expect uh, that it's going to be quite some time before the Fed raises rates. Now, of course, cyclically, um, in any environment where we see the economy strengthening enough for the Fed to begin lifting rates, 
um, the economy is strong enough. So you've got rising profits, you've got rising incomes, you've got increased spending. Uh, so you've got a rising neutral rate. So the Fed is just raising rates in order many times in order to keep an, an, a policy accommodation in line with a rising R star, so to speak. Uh, right. And so you're not really tightening conditions that much. You're just keeping up with the fundamentals, so to speak. That's cyclically what happens. And so it's not necessarily that if you get rising mortgage rates, that it hampers affordability enough in light of rising incomes in order to uh, put a significant dampener um, on the housing market. And so that's the way I would think of it. I would also think of it as, um, you know, I often get asked the question of, uh, doesn't the Fed um, not want to allow the 10 year to rise uh, too much? Or there's this view out there that no matter what, the Fed's going to keep uh, interest rates, uh, long, long term yields depressed. Um, that's not their active role. Um, their active role is to provide, to keep uh, financial conditions supportive and credit flowing to the economy. If interest rates are rising because you've got a fundamentally stronger economy, because you're in a different place in the outlook, because we're coming out from under the cloud of COVID and growth is strengthening, the unemployment rate is falling further, then interest rates should be higher. And the Fed is perfectly okay with that. And the economy can absorb that because we're on stronger, stronger footing. The quote unquote good inflation. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, along those lines, another inflation question. This one is related to f food prices and supply chain disruptions um, and, and essentially the subsidy across value chain to defend against structural changes in reduced demand. So uh, that's a fancy way of putting it, but essentially, you know, some of these, what perhaps maybe um, appear somewhat temporary supply disruptions, but as we're, um, and I'll add a little commentary in it, as we're also seeing within uh, automotive, and we do have Jonathan Smoke on, so John can <laughs> address that too, but we're seeing supply chain disruption across many industries that's rippling through and it's still here. And we we seemingly, you know, nine, 10 months beyond the, the, the you know, V part of the recession here. Um, you know, address some of those supply chain disruptions. Again, they were looking for the food part, but uh, address that, please. Yeah, so I think, yeah, food is always interesting because food uh, is always, always, always transitory. Um, and it, it uh, a lot of commodity uh, experts would, would argue uh, otherwise, but from a monetary policy making standpoint, food prices are always transitory. Uh, and that also uh, oftentimes comes with the frustration of households who um, experience higher, um, higher food prices. Um, you know, so I put it in the same category, the, the supply disruptions, I put in the same category as supply constraints on the services side as well. Um, that ultimately global supply chains move. Now that's a much longer process than say, bringing supply back online in the services sector. It's a much longer process. Um, and so <clears throat> there are parts of it that don't feel very transitory. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, uh, last year in May, when we came out with this view of V-shaped recovery, um, which, which sort of rubbed people the wrong way because it was a little bit of a tough time to hear that kind of lofty talk um, at a time when things were very painful in the economy. But we also at the same time put out a thesis of why in, in longer run inflation would be structurally higher, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that included uh, the view from some of our strategists and policy, policy experts uh, about not deglobalization, but slowbalization. Um, and so one reason why you shouldn't expect um, uh, what held inflation down over the last decade or two would be the same factors that would hold inflation down going forward so that slobalization being one of them, right? That we wouldn't have as much downward pressure on inflation from globalization uh, going forward. Um, and so that would speak to some of those supply chain disruptions being uh, you know, more uh, of a long-term uh, development uh, in terms of relocating supply chains and the cost pressures there that would need to be passed on. Um, we also talked about fiscal, if I just go a little bit further here, we also talked about fiscal policy activism. So there's a cultural shift here. There's a, there's a revolution uh, underway um, in the US 
um, being driven by the younger demographics, which we have underscored the younger demographics rule in the US now. The baby boomers are moving out of the, the influential time where they were really, um, uh, uh, where they've been moving into their uh, older age ranges and depressing inflation uh, since they peaked in the 1990s, which was their peak in terms of influencing inflation to the upside. Since then, they've been inflation, uh, influencing inflation to the downside. But now, millennials and Gen Z grossly outweigh the baby boomers, and they're moving into their prime earning years and prime working years, which is, tends to be associated with higher rates uh, of inflation. So that youth demographic is part of that cultural revolution. And the fact that we never addressed inequality after the financial crisis, and it's only been blown apart even further, or uncovered even further, we think fiscal policy activism, so a focus toward raising the labor share of profits will also contribute to upside longer term structurally higher inflation. Then you throw tech regulation into it, uh, and uh, the fact that we think that uh, woven into the institutional fabric for how we respond to crises in the future will lead to, we think, a more um, permanent shift toward this coordination between Treasury and the Fed um, and incredible fiscal and monetary policy response. So all together, uh, which the, the, the globalization theme, the supply chain theme is only a part of that, um, we think at least provides strong uh, support for why we shouldn't be so complacent that because we've not seen inflation for quite some time that we won't see inflation going forward. Yeah, just because it happened doesn't mean it's going to continue to happen, right? Yeah, something about past returns don't guarantee future results. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. All right, so we got a few more minutes. We have a couple more questions, but you touched on one that does relate to um, employment and uh, sort of uh higher higher wages so there's a question that uh, along the lines and says you know the the outlook that you provided was a little bit optimistic perhaps on the unemployment side and how does that jive with further stimulus payments and lower household incomes uh, and a potential rise in the minimum wage to fifteen dollars is that a disincentive to return to work compounded by higher minimum wage so yeah. a lot of cross currents in that question but uh, address yeah. some of those, please. It's it's a good question. I mean, that that was a very prevalent question um, after the CARES Act, where there are competing studies out there, some pointing to uh, no uh, response at all in terms of uh, no evidence at all that that federal supplemental that was giving us that 120 replacement rate on uh, income, uh, that no evidence at all that that was discouraging workers to return. Um, two other studies that have pointed to clear effects um, uh, of uh, you know, businesses reporting uh, a tough time getting workers back uh, into um, uh, the workplace uh, because of the replacement rate. Now, on the ones saying that they were having trouble getting workers back, it may, it may be that we're not able to tell how much was because they were um, solely because they were getting paid so much. Uh, to not work, or simply because uh, no amount of money was going to overcome the fear they had. The, the pandemic. Time. Right, the pandemic, putting themselves right. at risk. So we've seen during that time, right, hazard pay. Hazard pay has gone up quite a bit for some of those low-wage paying service sectors, um, especially in the restaurant sector when restaurants were open uh, to a greater degree before winter. Um, where um, uh, we ended up having to pay a lot more. Now, you know, I've talked to our, our equity strategists um, and they seem to be a bit more complacent than I am around, well, but this is just temporary hazard pay. It's not something that's gonna permanently raise uh, labor costs for those firms because the pandemic will be over. Um, but as an economist, I've studied just how sticky wages can wages. be. <laughs> um, now, once you start right. up paying people, is it going to be easy to say, when do you say, okay, I gauge that the risk of COVID has passed and I have proof that you got your vaccine, therefore I'm lowering your pay from, from X to, to Z. Uh, right. uh, and so um, I think what will end up um, alleviating, alleviating some of that pressure will, will, will have to be simple turnover. 
it's, those are some of the same sectors which tend to have high rates of turnover. And so as you're bringing new people in, maybe you're not having to uppay as much um, because right. you're bringing new people in. But I think that we'll see wages in those, those sectors. I think labor costs in those leisure and hospitality and retail sectors, restaurants um, and the like, I think there, there will be pressures there uh, for longer. Um, and so that can, that can lead to some of the um, cost push inflation, although we've seen wages rise before, and this would speak to the, the flat Phillips curve, we've seen wages rise before without a lot of pass through um, to inflation. On the minimum wage, I do agree that that would uh, exacerbate the, the, the issue of higher labor costs. I think even circles of academia, and it doesn't matter whether you're on the right or left either, I think there's broad agreement. Um, uh, let me say, instead of left or right, let me characterize it as the center. Um, there's broad agreement with the academic studies um, that um, you don't tend to raise the unemployment rate immediately. So it's not like we put minimum wage in place, uh, increases in place, and immediately we let people go, but we sure do hire less. And it ends up affecting those communities that tend to already suffer from high rates of unemployment, youth and minorities and women who all disproportionately make up um, a greater share of the services uh, sector industry. So I think a minimum wage right now would actually deepen that divide in the labor market between the haves and has not in terms of the types of jobs um, that we're creating because you're gonna slow job creation in some of those service sector areas. I also believe that a federal minimum wage and especially because it would be uh, uh, phased in over time um, doesn't have as much impact as people think that it does because you have so many states across the US that already pay well higher than the federal minimum wage. And by the way, when those state minimum wage increases went in, they were all phased in over time uh, as well. Um, it's one of those pieces uh, of legislation that's part of the stimulus package that we do not think will get passed by the Biden administration. The moderate Democrats who own the show here, you're gonna have to get things passed uh, through them in order to get some of these policies in place. And I just don't think the votes are going to be there for a federal minimum wage increase. Yeah. yeah, particularly if they're trying to keep it streamlined to COVID related, it gets kind of yeah. tough. Yeah. Uh, so we do have one that's uh, 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 in the same vein. Um, do you anticipate a rise in evictions and foreclosures? There's been this moratorium and it does seem like it's kicked along. And then, or is there a, your sense as far as... Uh, you know, unemployment assistance and, and inf, uh, income transfers and income and eviction and foreclosure moratoriums and those sort of things and, and forbearance being dragged out. Some of these are, at least on a national basis, are going to be, you know, lapping a year here pretty soon. So what's the impact of that? Do you, is that abnormally, I guess is the, the crux of this question is that, is that abnormally um, not giving us market signals. So what's your view there? Yeah, so I think, you know, we've, we've seen the most vulnerable parts of credit markets uh, in terms of, of the consumer side um, break down. Now, already before COVID, we were seeing the subprime areas of credit cards and motor vehicle um, credit, the subprime areas where delinquencies were rising. And you would typically see that as you move further into um, an expansion. Um, and so those continue to be the areas that are most pressured. Now, would defaults and delinquencies be much higher today than if we gave no help? Absolutely. So absolutely. But how much has it just delayed the day of reckoning versus helped build a bridge? I think what, we're, what our banking strategists are expecting uh, on the other side of these programs as you know, they've all been extended, I think this next round of legislation will extend them further. Um, and the hope always with these programs, because we do this with every cyclical downturn, not to the same degree that we have, but banks um, on their, of their own um, volition provide uh, workout and help for many of their uh, customers uh, during downturns. This, is, this has much more oomph to it. It's a much bigger process with government, um, government assistance behind it. Um, but um, the whole point of these programs, right, is again, as you provide the assistance until enough of the economy is back on its feet, so that as you slowly transfer people, uh, transition people away from government assistance, 
back toward labor income or a more fully employed labor market, then you're minimizing the fallout, right? So you've built that bridge, but there are going to be people that fall off the bridge or that just don't have a chance of ever getting employed again. And we're just dragging out the day of reckoning. So I do think um, in the second quarter, uh, when mo many of these programs that have been extended will have expired, um, our banking strategies do expect delinquencies um, and defaults um, to uh, accelerate. Um, but what they're certainly not looking for um, is anything akin to what we saw uh, after 2008. And part of that, again, is going back to the lack of a balance sheet recession. We went into this downturn with, in aggregate, household balance sheets being the healthiest that they've been in a very long time. And these policies have helped us keep a balance sheet recession from overlaying that. Um, and so, um, but, but we're not going to escape unscathed. I think we are going to see delinquencies and, and defaults pick up. What I'll be watching for is to be sure that they're still uh, concentrated in the low credit quality uh, spectrum uh, of credit markets and that it doesn't start to march up the income chain to start to capture middle and, and upper income households. That's where you're starting to end a credit cycle, uh, not begin a credit cycle. All right, Ellen, we're kind of ran out of time here and very much appreciate your time and your...